Okay, good morning everyone. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak today, Annie and Committee, for the Australian Citizen Science Conference this year. I feel like I've just made it here by the skin of my teeth and I might need some of that Bunya superfood <laughs> to get me through the day. So thanks to a storm in Canberra last night, I'm here about 14 hours later than, than I anticipated. But it is wonderful to be here on Cubby Cubby Country and um, thank you Ezekiel. I'm not sure if he's still in the room, but that was a really cool welcome to country in language, but also just sharing language names for so many um, places and, and wildlife around here, which does indeed tell a story, a story of this country. And I will be thinking about being on, at least in part, on um, Red Belly Black Snake Country while I'm here. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this region, elders past, present and emerging, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island uh, participants who are in the audience today. I'm going to be speaking about Australia's wildlife, so I'd like to particularly acknowledge that Australia's plants and animals are central to the, the spiritual um, and um, um, spiritual sort of identity of Aboriginal Australians, and um, and also uh, spiritual and cultural identity, and also that um, our First Nations people have really been our, our citizen scientists for many, many thousands of years. So, because I'm so late, I haven't quite worked out how to change the slides, so just bear with me while I do that. I presume I press a button here, do I? The big green one? Let's give it a go. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, citizen science has a very important role to play in growing our knowledge of threatened species and contributing to their recovery. I'm really thrilled to be here today to be able to share some of the work the Australian Government is doing in partnership with many, and many of you in the room as well, and to be able to learn from the many speakers and practitioners here today. So for my presentation, I wanted to do a couple of different things. I'm going to start with a, a state of play of threatened species in Australia, the role of the Australian Government and, and myself as Threatened Species Commissioner in supporting the recovery of those species. I'll touch on the Australian Government's Threatened Species Action Plan, its links to citizen science, including community engagement um, and awareness raising, before delving into a few examples um, of how citizen science fits in and plays an important role in threatened species recovery. So including um, as a response to natural disasters, including bushfires, which have already come up, the National Koala Monitoring Program, because we're in good koala country today, and the Australian Bird and Bat Banding Scheme. I'll then briefly cover how citizen science might play an increasingly important role in our national biodiversity data. And because I was a bit rushed, I'm not sure exactly how long I'm going to speak for, but I think and hope there'll be some time for questions at the end. It'd be great to have a bit of interaction. And if not, I'll be hanging around for most of the day and hope to catch up with people. Okay. So for some context setting for threatened species. So we all know Australia is a very special place, but what is it that makes Australia so unique? So Australia is one of the world's megadiverse countries. That means it's one of 17 countries which occupy only 10% of the land surface, but account for 70% of the world's biodiversity. Our ecosystems are globally distinct, ranging from alpine, temperate, rainforest, freshwater, and arid ecosystems. And they are unique. We have species which are evolutionarily distinct, such as the Wollamai pine, which many of you will be familiar with, pictured here, and we have extremely high levels of endemism, that is plants and animals which are only found here in Australia. We're home to 85% um, of our plant species are endemic. Australia is home to half the world's mammal species. And some species, like the critically endangered plains wanderer, this goofy little bird, which I love in the corner here, are the only species in their entire family. So how are our, how are our species faring? So the most recent State of the Environment report was released by Minister Plibersek last year and that report pulled no punches in that it summarised that the state and trend of our environment is poor and deteriorating. There are now more than 2,100 species, species and ecological communities. These are the most up-to-date figures updated for the state, from the State of the Environment report. So more than 2,100 entities that are listed as threatened under our Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, so, so nationally recognised as threatened. This includes over 100 species which are already extinct. And the list of threatened species continues to grow, both the number on the list, but also the extinction risk for those that are on the list. 
This is both a trend, but also a big jump in those numbers following the 2019-20 bushfire event, which we're still, still processing within the Australian government. So it's not exaggerating to say that the challenge to the existence of plants and animals that define Australia is bigger than ever. And many threatened species and ecological communities are, are today suffering from the impact of multiple threats. So each species is impacted on average by four major threats, whether that be habitat loss, invasive species, climate change, and these threats interact to be cumulative, so to be, so to be worse than the sum of their parts. The State of the Environment report, importantly, also found that the impacts of biodiversity loss are found at all levels. Biodiversity, of course, is central to First Nations peoples, and it underpins our well-being, our health, our climate, and our economy. So the Australian government's role in, in the recovery of threatened species is multifaceted. We have a key role to regulate activities under the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. Um, threatened species, but also other matters of national environmental significance. And the Australian government, many of you will be aware, is pursuing significant reforms of that national environment law um, right now. That's guided by Minister Plibersek's um, Nature Positive Plan. The government also provides national leadership through policies and strategies, including the Threatened Species Action Plan, which I'll talk about today. We invest um, in threatened species recovery through programs such as the Natural Heritage Trust and also the, the Newer Saving Native Species Program. We invest in applied research for threatened species through the National Environmental Science Program, so that there's a continual sort of information loop between our programs and regulation and science through that program. We manage Commonwealth and joint managed protected areas, both on the terrestrial and the marine estate, which are important places for many threatened species. And of course, we work within a federated system. So the states and territories have important roles and powers, and the recovery of threatened species and ecological communities requires very close collaboration across governments if it's to be effective. And we work in partnership with others, with landholders, First Nations people, private sector conservation groups, citizen scientists, you name it, um, to, to achieve threatened species recovery. Okay, so where does my role as a threatened species commissioner fit in? I'm a member of staff at the Department of Climate Change, Energy, Environment and Water, but I have a unique role to bring a national focus to threatened species and threatened ecological communities. I lead a small but, but passionate office and we work to bring together research, on-ground action and effective partnerships to achieve the best possible outcomes for threatened species. One important role of my office is to raise awareness about threatened species issues. So this includes both awareness around the threats and challenges, but also to celebrate recovery efforts and to try and reach and educate and influence a much broader, a much broader audience than, the, than just the conservation sector. And a core part of my work is, is leading the implementation of a national action plan, action plan for threatened species recovery. Uh, this is it, it's a threatened species national action plan, which has just had its first birthday, was released in October last year by, by Minister Plibersek. So many of you will be familiar with this plan, but for those of you who aren't, it's a, it's a 10 year plan which prioritises threatened species, places, and also activities such as threat mitigation at a national level. The plan is an important component of the Australian government's um, um, nature positive agenda, and the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act reforms that are underway to strengthen our national environment laws are critical for providing or providing better protection for our threatened species, but stronger legal protections alone will not be sufficient to recover our threatened species. So the action plan is there to provide strategic um, guidance on proactive and many practical actions to mitigate threats and recover species in conjunction with improved environment laws. It helps to direct Australian government funding, but the action plan is also an invitation for all industry for all Australians to collaborate and to direct our recovery efforts where they're most needed. Just a bit more about the action plan. Um, so it's got four overarching objectives to be achieved within, within 10 years. So that includes no new extinctions, so the headline objective, 30% of our land mass to be protected and conserved, 
improving the trajectory for 110 priority species across all the taxonomic groups, and improving the condition for 20 priority places which contain um, sizable numbers of threatened species and threatened ecological communities. So these objectives relate closely to the Global Biodiversity Framework objectives, which were agreed a few months after the action plan was released last year, particularly the no new extinctions and the, and the so-called 30 by 30 objective for, for land protection. Below those four high-level objectives are 22 targets, many of which are outcomes-based and measurable, um, which are to be achieved in a five-year period. And as far as reporting goes, in 2025 we'll um, do a progress report on how we're going with implementation of the plan, and in 2027 we'll do a full review of the pro uh, of progress under the action plan. Okay, so citizen scientists and community groups played an important role in improving the trajectories of several threatened species under the first threatened species strategy. And the new action plan intends to build on this. Um, and target 22, which goes to the participation of the community um, and citizen scientists um, in the recovery of accessible priority species and places, captures this intention. So what does this look like and why is it important? Citizen science for threatened species means having members of the general public involved in research and data collection. They may be leaders or contributors, and their participation may contribute to science or policy or assist in on-ground efforts. This is incredibly important, not least because many of our threatened species are data poor, and additional knowledge helps us to better understand trends and to inform management. We also know that having a community connected to and invested in the local environment is a vital ingredient in threatened species recovery. All of you will be aware that citizen science takes many shapes and forms, very much a choose your own adventure. And engagement and projects can range from, from one-off short terms to, to long-term and longitudinal studies. They can be local or national and even global in scale. So under the, the banner of the action plan, we intend to do what we can to support citizen science partners and initiatives. This ranges from supporting long-term initiatives uh, running through our department to funding shorter term threatened species projects, which include citizen science participation, to promoting the importance of citizen science endeavors as a vehicle for communicating the science of biodiversity conservation and in the knowledge that they can be a pathway for behavioral change for participants. Okay, so, so on the awareness raising side of things, through, through my social media channels, we make a conscious effort to promote threatened species related citizen science projects, both to celebrate um, advances in knowledge and action, but also because they are excellent awareness raisers. Frankly, they're just very popular posts. So in the last month alone, the most popular post on my Facebook channel was about Zoos Victoria's moth tracker, which we've got up there on the side. There were more than 1,400 reactions um, in Metaspeak to the information about this citizen science project on the Bogong moth's annual migration. And of course, a cute picture of the kidney possum helps, helps in that sort of attention grabbing. The Aussie bird count was in our top three. We also posted about Frog, Frog ID Week, um, bird life speech nesting bird monitoring training workshops, and the dead tree detective. But our most popular post for the whole of 2022 was yet another citizen science post. Um, it's, it's one featured in the middle there and it reported that we now know more about gang gang cockatoo behaviour thanks to observations by citizen scientists and a bird called Baldy. So this male gang gang raised two chicks in Canberra bushland with his long-term partner. Um, he had distinctive damage to his crest which you can see here so it could be easily recognised by citizens. Local res residents were asked to keep an eye out for Baldy and to report any sightings that they made of him. And from those sightings, one of the things we learned was that um, adult gang gangs um, with chicks on the nest can travel up to four kilometres to, to feed um, from an active nest to feed. So I think you're going to be hearing more about this work from my fellow Canberran, Michael Mulvaney. I hope he's made it here as well. He might have been way late like I was um, tomorrow. But in the meantime, many thanks to the Red Hill Bush Regenerators in Canberra for expanding our understanding of gang gangs through a citizen science project which was supported under our bushfire recovery funding. 
So in a not um, very statistically significant analysis of what seems to get my social media follow followers engaged in citizen science posts, um, a good photo of a char charismatic species, so no surprise with that, and an indication that anyone can do it. So the local residents in the story about um, Baldy, the city dwellers who saw the Bogon moths um, congregating around light sources, anyone who has clocked a bird in their backyard and could log it on the Aussie Bird Count app. So I know many of you will have participated in our annual um, Threatened Species Awareness Raising campaign, the Threatened Species Bake Off, and thank you for those who have submitted cakes over the years. So twice in the last few years, we have highlighted citizen science in the Bake Off theme. In 2020, we teamed up with Backyard Bush Blitz for the Bake Off to give it a local focus. So we asked participants to bake a likeness of a threatened species found in their local area or their backyard. It linked to the Bush Blitz Backyard Species Discovery Project um, on iNaturalist. So the aim was to teach species identification skills along alongside having some fun in the kitchen at the same time as contributing valuable inf species information to the Atlas of Living Australia. Last year, this, the theme was, what species have you spotted? Um, and it encouraged people to bake something that looked like a threatened species they had seen in real life and maybe even contributed that observation to a citizen science database. Uh, Costa, who is coming here on Thursday, who I'll miss, unfortunately, but was our celebrity judge last year. So it was great to be able to catch up with him, talk about threatened species over a piece of bogon moth cake, which is what that cake is there. But the idea with having celebrity judges such as Costa and the many others we've had is to reach a broader audience um, to engage in threatened species conservation and awareness than just the conservation sector. Okay, so I wanted to get into a couple of um, examples now. And I guess to set the scene for this one, for threatened species, a key threat to Australian wildlife into the future is the increasing frequency and severity of natural, nat natural disasters. So engaging the community and channeling the, the desire to help once it's safe to do so can assist with the recovery effort. And citizen scientists are, are able to mobilise quickly to help inform responses and to measure recovery. So following the devastating 2019-20 bushfires, the Australian Government funded three citizen science projects led by the Atlas of Living Australia in partnership with CSIRO researchers and the citizen science community. I was co-leading the Australian Government's bushfire response um, at the time and it was great to work with Erin Roger, who may or may not be here, already um, though these projects were essentially her brainchild so it was great to work with her to, to support these projects get underway. So the first was three bushfire fire blitz events. Each were three day long events with locals and researchers talking, learning and recording species um, in bushfire impacted areas. It was a really great outcome with nearly 8,000 8, species um, observations made to iNaturalist and in turn onto Atlas of Living Australia representing 1,773 unique species and 29 threatened species. Over 500 people participated and many of my staff has participated and were really blown away by the experience and the incredible expertise that was on hand for those particular um, fire blitzes. The next project, the second project is Flora Connections, which was, a stel which was established to help um, collect detailed plant information targeting species which were significantly or believed to be significantly impacted by the bushfires but weren't yet nationally listed as threatened species. So this project is still running today and it's a great example of how citizen science can help feed into national processes such as threatened species listings under our national environment law. And the third, the third bushfire project I'd like to mention was the invertebrate um, digitisation project which involved digitising insect records and enlisting volunteers to transcribe insect specimens, uh, specimen labels via Digivol, um, with the oldest specimen dating back to 1906. So big numbers again, over 8,000 images were transcribed in this pretty popular project which attracted more than 250 participants. And again, this linked to the department's work. Um, so our bushfire expert panel had developed a list of invertebrates 
which were likely impacted by the bushfires and needed assessments following the fires. So having a historical records now in an accessible format is an important input to this process. The Australian Museum's Digivol platform hosted by ALA is a fantastic initiative which is accessible to citizen scientists who want to contribute from home. So the digitisation project involved volunteers ranging from 12 up to, I think, 90 years in age, which is a pretty impressive age, age range and a project that can engage that, that range of people. So although born out of a disaster, it was great to be able to channel that citizen science energy and goodwill to support the post-bushfire recovery efforts. And furthermore, research which had been conducted previously under the National Environmental Science Program had shown that birds and mammals constituted about 80% of citizen science taxonomic projects. So it was really good to be able to address, balance the ledger a bit by a focus on, on, um, on plants and invertebrates through this project. Then still on, still on natural disasters, I'd like to share another quite different example of where citizen science is playing a key role in disaster response. And in this, ca in this case, blackwater events in the Murray-Darling. So my colleagues um, in the Commonwealth Environmental Water Office based in Canberra have developed Flow Mur, which is a monitoring program in partnership with scientists, with water managers and with communities across the Murray-Darling to help understand how fish, birds, vegetation and river connectivity are responding to Commonwealth environmental water. So recently following the, um, the widespread flooding in New South Wales, Large amounts of organic matter in the system um, led to a major low oxygen or black water event, um, of which course leads to mash fish deaths and impacts on, on local threatened species. What FLOMER does, Flo does is facilitate citizen scientists to provide rapid feedback on local water quality to water managers and emergency response teams. So this means that the Commonwealth Environmental Water Office is able to release better quality water to the right place at the right time to help native fish without exacerbating the impacts of flooding. And this, this picture up in the top here is one of the volunteers, citizen scientists, Anthony from Demiloquin on the Edward River, where water for the environment was used to create refuges, refuge patches following that recent black water event. Okay, so I did want to talk about the National Koala Monitoring Program while we're here on koala country and most of you I assume will be aware that the koala across, across Queensland, New South Wales and the ACT is now listed as endangered under our national environment law. It's also one of the 110 priority species under the Threatened Species Action Plan. We're really pleased to have a new koala recovery plan in place and implementation underway. That plan was released last year. However, there are real gaps in our knowledge about koala populations. Koalas are easy to identify, but they're not so easy to detect. So we need a better handle on the species trends across this range. And the Australian government is investing in the National Koala Monitoring Program, which is basically a two million a year ongoing program. It aims to fill knowledge gaps by providing robust population estimates and build a longer term capacity to monitor trends in koala populations. The program has been led by CSIRO and it has been co-designed with community groups, with First Nations and with uh, First Nations people and koala scientists. And the principles of this process are that it be long term, so we want to support the long lasting capability for species monitoring, that it be inclusive so everyone in the community, community can contribute to the monitoring effort, and we want it to be integrative of different data. So while multiple approaches are harder to, to model population estimates, this actually increases the data availability and fosters partnerships to share responsibility for koala monitoring and management and allows for the community to contribute using the method that suits them and their local context. The program uses a variety of monitoring methods and citizen science is definitely a key component of this. Okay, so there were two, two types of citizen science data which are contributing to the International Monitoring Program. Opportunistic data, so any and all data um, collected across a variety of science, including using simple presence and or absence data. And targeted data at predetermined potential habitat, um, logging scats, scratchings or koala presence, and it may be confirmed by drones or other methods. All of the citizen science data is accessible, but agreement is sought before release to the public. 
the data are also curated either through the ALA for opportunistic data or through the National Koala Monitoring Program for the targeted data. And the program has established a citizen science community of practice. Um, it includes the Australian Citizen Science Association, ALA, others to help provide advice about citizen science contributions to koala. Two mobile phone apps have been developed um, and I encourage people to use them if they're not on your phone already. Um, the Koala Spotter app for citizen science observations and the Koala Counter Act for transect data. Okay, so the, the National Koala Monitoring Program also manages data held by First Nations groups and it does this a little differently. Recognising that traditional owners hold a wealth of knowledge about many threatened species, including the koala, we want to ensure that this traditional knowledge is handled sensitively and appropriately. Koalas are a totem species for many First Nations groups and are an important part of the biocultural landscape. A First Nations community of practice um, has been established. It includes First Nations and agency representatives to develop ways to support traditional owners to monitor koalas, not just their occurrence, but also their habitat and their health, to share knowledge and to support First Nations elders and managers to make decisions about koala and country. The partnership generally falls into three categories, which I think we have listed here. Um, First Nations koala knowledge building and sharing. So this is about supporting First Nations individuals and groups to share koala knowledge within First Nations communities. Koala knowledge sharing, sharing knowledge about koalas and habitats between First Nations and Western scientists, and koala data collection. So First Nations um, groups who collect data about koalas using any of the methods in the National Koala Monitoring Program. The program details protocols for cultural and fieldwork safety, how to establish partnership agreements, respect for Indigenous cultural and intellectual property, and Indigenous data sovereignty and data governance. And data governance arrangements depend on the types of data and the sensitivities. For example, drone data around sacred sites may need to have more limited access. Traditional owners and Indigenous rangers control the access gateways and identify which data can be made available to researchers, partners and to the general public. So, so all of this monitoring effort, and it's still early days, will result in additional data for our national koala population model. The data-driven model from March of this year, which is up on the screen, estimates the population is somewhere between 76,000, uh, 86,000 and 176,000 koalas across its listed range. And this is after adjusting the model for areas where we think there are little to no data, where there is little to no data but where we strongly suspect koalas are no longer present. So the model clearly needs to, for the error bars to, be, to come down and be improved, and this will occur with collecting additional survey data in the years to come. The current estimate relies quite heavily on uh, pre-existing data from a wide range of sources, and the future estimates will be updated with contemporary data from on-ground monitoring efforts. More data are needed from remote and um, and regional areas in the west of the koalas range, where we strongly suspect there are not koalas anymore. And citizen scientists de definitely have a role to play in improving the data that is going to, that supports this model and increasingly so over time. Uh, I think we've got um, Maggie and Romaine talking later today on more on koalas, so I look forward to, to hearing from those experts as well. Okay, so the final Australian Government example I wanted to draw on today is the Australian Bird and Bats Banding Scheme, which this year turned 70. So this is a program which I actively contributed to in my youth, but have only recently really understood how important it is and the key role of citizen scientists in this scheme. Having a coordinated research and monitoring scheme at a national scale, no surprises, is really important for the creation of reliable national databases. The team are based just down the corridor from me in Canberra. You can see their squishy little office there with all the vans. Um, and, um, and, but their functions are many, and they include authorising banders and allocating bands. They include coordinating a public um, band recovery program. Data curation and requests, they currently hold over 4.4 million records. Um, project and marking approvals in conjunction with the states and territory permitters 
and digitisation of records. They're almost halfway through one million records. The, the information held by the scheme is valuable in helping us understand the protection and recovery needs of threatened birds and bat species. So alongside monitoring data, new species records are also discovered, such as this footed plover, which is one of the 110 priority species under the Threatened Species Action Plan, which recently set a distance record of nearly 800 kilometres. And the short-tailed shearwater, which holds the Australian longevity record, or time between banding and recovery, of a massive 48 years. The scheme owes much of its success to citizen scientists and volunteers. So the scheme's regional organisers have a number of duties, including training and recruitment of banders and trainers, particularly those monitoring projects which span decades. So they might be born out of a funded project but carry on through volunteers because the scheme itself doesn't actually fund projects or, or research. For example, the Victorian Way to Study Group, which um, started monitoring in 1975, and the Western Australian Fair Return Network, which was set up in 2016 and already has over 500 members who help with species recovery, including um, banding bird monitoring. The easiest way to get involved is to report any bans on birds and bats via our website. And the hooded plover movement record that I just mentioned is only known to us because a member of the public reported that sighting. Um, online. So looking ahead with the Australian Bird and Bat Banding Scheme, the team are continuing to digitise those records and upgrade the database, but they're also looking at working on integration with other systems, including the Atlas of Living Australia, the Threatened Species Index and the Australian Government's Biodiversity Data Repository. Speaking of which, it's a segue into my final slide, that repository. So to wrap up, I thought I would now switch to describing how different systems and data sources, including citizen science generated data, feed into what we're doing in the Australian government. And the biodiversity data space is undergoing some really exciting um, changes and improvements at the moment. So there are a number of sources of data across the country which import or will in the future into various infrastructure or systems, which we can then draw on to best undertake our responsibilities for protecting and recovering threatened species. So with our Natural Heritage Trust program, we're supporting improvements in the way we monitor and, rep and report on our biodiversity conservation investments. Working with Terrestrial Ecosystems Research Network, my NHT colleagues um, and TURN have established an Australian Biodiversity Information Standard. TURN are also currently developing ecological monitoring system modules and threatened species monitoring protocols with a focus on those 110 priority species under the Threatened Species Action Plan. Our overarching infrastructure at a national level uh, for managing biodiversity data will be the Biodiversity Data Repository, which will assemble a trusted and defensible biodiversity data resource for Australia. The repository will provide timely access to high quality information this information will, it will support environmental decision making, planning, policy development and reporting, leading to improvements in the management and conservation of our biodiversity. The repository will include occurrences of species from incidental observations, vouchered specimens, biodiversity surveys and monitoring programs. And to enable trust and confidence in the BDR, it's important that the data sources pay sufficient attention to data quality. So the BDR will include data from citizen science projects that are sufficiently accurate and defensible, for example, through the use of expert vet vetting, through peer validation and other data validation methods. So some species, of course, are readily um, and accurately identifiable by citizens and records of such species will very likely be included in the BDR. They meet those relevant data standards. Other species are very difficult to identify and it may be difficult for such citizen science records to pass validation and quality checks required by the, B, by the BDR. So while, um, while I'm talking about infrastructure, I would like to give a shout out to the Threatened Species Index or the TSX and I think you might be hearing more from Kate Irvine at this conference from TURN on this. The TSX was developed under the National Environmental Science Program and provides, provide measures of change in the relative abundance of Australia's threatened species at national, state and regional levels. 
So we use the TSX in our, now in our department's annual reporting and we encourage projects that we fund under Australian government programs to input into the TSX where they include monitoring data. Although most data sets in the TSX come from, from conservation practitioners and ecologists, the TSX does include quite a bit of long-term data on threatened bird species, um, which are from BirdLife Australia and which are data collected largely by dedicated citizen scientists. I understand the TSX team are, um, hopes to harness other citizen science databases, um, such as Frog ID, to expand the current taxa group. So currently the TSX just includes birds, mammals and plants. So through the development of data and monitoring standards for citizen science projects, there's great potential to get more citizen science data into the TSX, and we're really keen to encourage this. And all of this feeds into the Australian government better fulfilling its responsibilities, including informing threatened species listing assessments, assessments of development proposals um, to better protect species, reporting, such as the department's annual reports, um, which use the TSX data, and they will help inform strategic threatened species recovery investments through our programs. Okay, so today I've outlined the important role that the Australian Government plays in coordinating national efforts to conserve our native plants and animals, but there is a lot more to do. The scale of the challenges facing our biodiversity means that we need collective action. And by working together, we can better align efforts and use resources to protect and recover threatened species for the future. And citizen science scientists are a very important part of this mix. Successful conservation, of course, needs robust ecological data and ongoing monitoring. And some of this is thanks to the efforts of citizen scientists. Many species need expert knowledge and considerable logistical support behind any data collection so these are less amenable to citizen science, but many of our threatened species are actually accessible to citizen scientists who can contribute meaningful data and information on how species are faring. For some threatened species, there are citizen scientist groups who are important stewards and advocates for the species that they support, and data collectors can become champions and spokespeople for these species. For other citizen scientists, um, for other citizen scientists, these initiatives are a gateway for the unengaged to become involved. They are opportunities for members of the community to do something, starting with some observations, contributing to and collecting um, other observations can be the first step in raising awareness about our native wildlife and in caring for its future. So I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to all the citizen scientists who are contributing to threatened species conservation and equally to the many scientists and program leaders who are facilitating and growing effective citizen science participation. From the primary school kids who do the annual bird count with their family, to the retired ornithologists who give hundreds of hours to recording um, data from band of birds, to the bushwalkers who take a moment to snap, um, snap a photo for IMAT when they're out on the trail, to the experts who verify the nature mapper records, to the urban bioblitzers who dedicate precious chunks of their weekend to carefully observing wildlife in their local area. And of course, to all of the people in the room here, you are all making a difference. By helping to answer research questions or contributing to scientific research, the efforts of citizen scientists can influence policy at the national level and can inform conservation action at many scales. And citizen scientists are helping me to do my, to do my job by connecting the communities with threatened species. One observation could lead to big decisions via a butterfly type effect, generating new knowledge or understanding. And Kev Carmody and Paul Kelly have said it better than I ever could, from little things, big things grow. The benefits for threatened species from citizen science are growing and I'm looking forward to where we go next. Thank you. Go easy, people. I've had a hard morning. <laughs> oh, thank you. 
Um, I, I'm interested in knowledge transfer into um, the um, predictive models, for example, that are being used by the um, assessment teams in approving projects and uh, wondering whether there have you tested whether this knowledge transfer is, is occurring and um, how does it um, influence the, um, uh, e the estimation of recovery, species recovery, in when projects promise that an offset will, will, um, will result in that? I feel like you need to distill your question a little bit for me because I think it covers the entire work of my department. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, um, so my, my knowledge of it is, is just in a slice of it where yeah. you see um, a proponent um, apply and they, they will say, well, we, we project that our offset will lead to recovery of a species mm -hmm. or can be rehabilitated to a standard that is equivalent of the lost habitat. And so this is all put into the, the, um, uh, the calculator and the calculator has, has obviously got a, a number of different scenarios that, that it, it works upon and will, you know, yeah, so, so... Yeah, the question's about offsets and how effective My question is about offsets, yeah, yeah. about knowledge transfer into the calculator, the black box. Yeah. So, so I'll start by saying I'm the Threatened Species Commissioner, so I'm not a regulator within the Australian Government, but I am familiar with how our offsets process works, but I'm not, I'm not the expert within our department on that, so I work very much um, in a collaborative um, and complementary way to the regulators. But the, I guess the way I would answer that question is it actually works differently for different species because the knowledge level for our threatened species varies enormously. For some species, we know exactly where they are and exactly what the threats are down to the individual. For others, they're very, very data poor, including on what the threats are and how they're impacting with those species. So, so it's, it's not really a very helpful answer for you, but it actually depends on the knowledge base that we have with those species and, again, how accessible some of that data is. It's not, it doesn't work as well as it should at the moment because our knowledge base is poor, but our systems for actually integrating data, the information that's in recovery plans, the information that's in threat abatement plans, the information that's actually published in research but not contributing to other databases to create a picture for where these species are and what is impacting them is not working as well as, it's, as it could. And that, I guess that is the entire premise of doing these NPDC reforms is to try and fix those parts, not just fix the law itself, but also fix all of the systems that back end that so that informed decisions can be made and better decisions can be made. Yes. Hi, um, thank you very much, Dr. Judy Friedlander from the University of Technology um, Institute for Sustainable Futures and Planting Seeds. Quick question, how do we go about accumulating data on other threatened species such as insects, which we know very little about? Gosh. <laughs> In fact, very little. <laughs> You're right, so insects are very much overlooked. You can see that when you look at that, they would be the majority of um, the, the, the species in Australia. They're underrepresented in our EPBC lists and actually many insects are still undescribed and you would be very familiar with, with all of those statistics. I guess there's different ways to do that and some of those ways include through some of those citizen science initiatives which are out there at the moment, such as bio blitz and, bio blitz and bush blitz and such like. But again, it is, I guess in my view, it's also a little around raising awareness about the importance of invertebrates and insects um, in, in our ecology, um, in the environment in which we live. So people notice what's happening in that space and also promoting some of the research that goes on. So I guess one of the things we've done to try and raise awareness and also increase the knowledge base on invertebrates is for the first time, including a bunch of invertebrates in the Threatened Species Action Plan. So we've now got a small number. They're, they're not well represented in our EPBC list to start with, but they're reasonably well, well represented in the SPEP Threatened Species Action Plan and different types of invertebrates. And the whole, and we've, we know with those, there's a couple of exceptions, but mostly they're extremely data poor. And the first thing we need to do is actually just pay people to go out and find out a bit more about them, or to really just pick the brains of the one expert who's there, who's got a whole lot of information sitting in some compactus in his actual office, um, and, and, and get, get our hands on that information. So I don't think there's a single answer to that question, but I would say the starting point is actually raising public awareness around the importance of invertebrates. Um, and and so, so it's then more on the radar of government 
of research institutions and of, of other individuals who are, who are working in this space. Okay, final question, and, and I'm going to um, break the golden rule of chairing, and I'm going to take that question, Fiona. Oh. <laughs> I'll go easy on you. Um, so we've heard a lot about um, the lack of information around threatened species. You know, we don't know the threats, the distribution, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you mentioned about citizen science information being opportunistic and targeted, being both of those things. And obviously, to fill some of those information gaps, we need targeted information. Um, and this relates to also the quality of citizen science information. Not all of it is of the quality that's required to help answer those questions. So I'm wondering how we can improve that quality, how we can actually get that targeted information that, that's robust enough to use in, in analysis and how, how perhaps your office and the government might be able to support citizen science groups to do that. Yeah, so a couple of responses to that, Amy. I would say... So if we think of the National Koala Monitoring Program, one of the beauties of that program, because we've got a lot of money to put into it to get it right, is that it's actually developing a method so that we can use poorer quality data, simple observational data. So that's, but you can't always do that unless you're sort of, you know, doing the research and the modelling to, to inform that. So for other species, um, it's, there's a couple of ways to come at this. Part of it is the projects that are being designed by scientists, by program leaders, having that in mind so that they're coming up with systems to be able to do that and having in mind where that might be picked up and used by broader state-based um, state based systems for monitoring or federal government systems for monitoring. So our part in that at the moment is we're developing standards for those 110 priority species. It's only a small portion of the 2,000, but it's a good start for those, which is what will require all of our funded projects to use. So our projects that are funded through the Australian government, a lot of them have on reach to citizen scientists. Um, they're often part of the mix of those bigger landscape scale projects or threatened species projects. So again, I think we need to come at this from, from different angles. Part of it is, and I'm hoping with the National Koala Monitoring Program, that the methodology that's being developed there will actually be able to be used for other, other sort of large programs for similar, similar species. So be able to uptake that, that sort of less robust and <laughs> validated data in some ways. But there's also lots of different pathways for trying to get systematic approaches for how we do this for, for threatened species. That's not a very good answer to your question because it's, it's very open-ended. But I would conclude by saying, I guess the way the Australian government engages in this is it actually at quite different, different levels. We do a lot of small species-specific things, and I tried to include a couple of those in, in those examples today, or, or sorry, small project-based you know, one-off initiatives. So the bushfire ones are a good example of that through to very long-term endeavours, which is the Australian Bird and Bat Banding Scheme um, and the National Koala Monitoring Program, which will be a long-term endeavour. And there's lots of other sort of, you know, in, in betweens of those projects as well. Thanks, Fiona. Yeah. And it's great to hear about the, the standards. That, that's a great start, but obviously citizen science groups may need a bit of support yeah. in actually interpreting those standards and, and actually operationalising them. So that's, yeah. Okay, well that's about all we have time for. Thank you so much, Fiona, for scrambling to get here and uh, giving me a great presentation. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>